So I'm giving my talk today on um, using Firebug um, specifically to edit CSS on your website. Um, so just so I can get a gauge on where you guys are at um, in the room, how many of you guys are familiar with CSS, have edited some CSS, and are looking to take that to the next level? And how many are completely new? OK, great. And um, how many um, people already have Firebug on their computer and have already used it a little bit? OK, great. Um, so I'm actually going to be starting from pretty, uh, pretty beginner stuff here. Um, it's not going to get too far into CSS, so if you're looking to, um, you know, if you already know CSS super well and you'd say you're a CSS coder, this is probably not the room for you. This is going to be mostly beginner, getting your feet wet with CSS, and I'm going to take it slow for the, for the beginners so that they know, you know, if they've never done CSS before, hopefully my goal is that they can walk out of here feeling comfortable and uh, being able to make those CSS edits and, and kind of start that exploration into a whole other programming language. So... Um, this is mostly going to be focusing on CSS, um, and I'm going to be using the tool Firebug for Firefox. Um, so we'll start with my first slide. First of all, what is Firebug? Um, Firebug is an add-on to the Firefox uh, web client, um, web browser. And what it does is it basically allows you to see the back of websites. Um, you know, everybody has been on the internet and seen the front of websites and knows what they're supposed to look like. But there's so much code, HTML, JavaScript, PHP, CSS, that goes into creating a website. And you can see um, this little area from here to here looks different than the rest of what you're used to looking at Google. And this is actually showing us the HTML that goes to building this page on Google and the CSS that's associated with that HTML. So what Firebug is going to do for us is it's going to add something to our Fire... Uh, what Firebug is going to do for us, it's going to add a um, little window to Firefox where we can inspect um, further into the websites that we can see beyond just what the whole rest of the world sees, the, the front end. We're going to start to see some code and while code may seem overwhelming and stuff, CSS is the easiest uh, programming language there is. Um, it's very undestructive. You can, make, you can make mistakes in CSS, and your website will still function. It may look a little bit funny, but it will still come up, and people can still click around. Whereas stuff like PHP, you put one comma in the wrong place, and all, all of a sudden you're getting the white screen of death when you reload the page, and nothing's coming up at all. Um, that's not going to happen with CSS, so take a deep breath, and we're uh, going to dive right into it. Um, so next slide here. Uh, while I am focusing mainly on Firebug, um, the same kind of general rules will apply for other inspectors um, in different website browsers. So if you're using Chrome and you're really stuck on Chrome and you're like, I'm never going to use Firefox, I'm not, you know, as much as he says Firefox is the, uh, the better browser, I'm going to use stick to Chrome. That's okay. Um, really, it's, it's, everyone has their own choice. I think the only reason why I'm stuck on Firebug is that's just what I learned on and that's what I'm used to. Um, so there's nothing wrong with Chrome. Um, I would say Chrome and Firefox are probably the better ones, but even Safari has a um, inspector. And Chrome and Safari actually have the inspectors built into them as well. So um, if you have Chrome, um, it has Chrome Dev Tools. And you can notice um, if you have a computer open right now, you can try in Chrome or, uh, or Safari, you can right click and you'll see, no matter where you right click, you can inspect an element, which will bring up the uh, little window that we saw earlier, in, uh, like in Firebug. Um, so um, while I am going to be giving the tutorial for Firebug, um, they'll look very similar to other inspectors on different web browsers. Um, so the first thing is, what is CSS? Um, I kind of went over that a little bit, but CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. Um, it's a very simple programming language. Um, as the name implies, it controls the style of your website, making universal styling rules that are applied throughout your website. So while you could go in there and, you know, for every single little uh, piece of text, you could put in all of your styling for each piece, what people realized at one point is there should be some universal styling rules to a website so it looks consistent throughout the website. So you're not going to one page and seeing a red header. On the next page, you're seeing a green header. You're seeing all kinds of different fonts, uh, typefaces. That kind of got us nauseating. If anyone of you used the internet in the you know, mid-90s, late-90s, you see, you'd see all kinds of crazy colors, and it, looked, it just looked cheap and, and not like someone didn't decide this is the styling that's going to be throughout the website. This is our brand. 
Um, so what CSS allows us to do is basically set rules that say, you know, every time this element, every time this header comes up, I want it to be this typeface, and I want it to be green. And that's my, that's my colors and my branding, and I want it to be consistent throughout my website. So then every time when you put in that heading, you're not going to have to say, this is a heading, I need it to be green, I need it to be this. It's just going to say, okay, I know H1s need to be this particular style. So it's going to keep a very consistent styling throughout your website. Um, CSS can control all kinds of things with styling. Fonts, font sizes, colors, spacing, borders, um, even animations. So I'm sure some of you have seen like you click on something and something a button wiggles or you know um, something's kind of hovering and moving a little bit or there's a shadow on a box or something like that. Most of the time that's going to be controlled with CSS. Um, you can do that a little bit with images and stuff. You can create shadows and and borders and stuff, but it's much better to use CSS most of the time, um, for, if not just to have consistent styling throughout the website, um, but your browser will render it a little bit better if you're using CSS instead of images. Um, again, CSS is one of the easiest programming languages to learn, and um, you know, CSS was a way to separate a document's content from its style. So I was, I was saying you could go in beforehand and say, I will, every time you put this heading in there, you can put the styling. Um, into the content for that H1. Instead, CSS gives us a way to, to have the content and, and keep on writing and have our heading and then our paragraph text and then another heading and some more paragraph text without all of the little markups saying, oh, this paragraph needs to be this font, this you know, heading needs to be this color. It, it gives us a separate document to put all that styling in once that will refer to the content throughout our website. So I know that's a lot of words and people like to really see you know, like I know you're, what you're saying, I kind of get it, but let's actually see some of that happen. Um, so before I get into how to install Firebug, I just want to hit you guys with a couple of options or a couple of examples of what Firebug can do so that you can kind of get it in your mind before we move too far forward. Um, so I'm going to open up a web browser here, and I'm going to go to a website that I have a very simple, um, out-of-the-box WordPress website here. Um, and I've just created a page for an example here. And if we look up in my um, utility bar up here, we see that there is a, um, a little bug right here. It might be hard to see from back there. And then there's a little arrow that says inspect element. So if I click this once, we'll see the window that I was talking about earlier pop up here. Um, and it, can you all read this at all? Or is this, it, to me, it seems very unreadable. Okay, well, unfortunately, I, I can't do much about the, the presentation of the thing, but um, I'll read it out from my computer if anyone has any questions, and um, we'll, we'll try and do our best here. Um, let me try one thing that might make it a little bit easier to read for you guys. I'm just going to change the display. Okay, that, that makes it a little easier. It makes it really small on my, my screen, so it's going to be a little harder for me, but I'll, I'll make do. Um, okay, so we have our website up here. We have um, our Firebug window down here. Um, on this side, we see the HTML that's associated with the website. On this side, we see the uh, CSS. And now you can swap that around a little bit, and, see, and Firebug's a little customizable. This is default, so this is what you'll see right when you download the, the program. Um, so again, um, I just clicked on, um, now it's kind of hidden it up here, but I can click on Firebug or Inspect to bring open this window. And then I can hover over the website. And you see that this little blue box highlights the different areas of the website. So these are the different um, content areas on the website um, that are specified within HTML. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have seen the HTML. Sometimes you'll see like H1, which stands for heading one, and you'll see open H1 bracket close, and then we'll see the closing H1 here. So anything that lives within that H1 area is a uh, heading one. Um, and we can um, select that area here. So I'm highlighting over this is H1 heading, and we see over on the left it highlights where that HTML is. And we don't see that open H1 up here. We just see the fact that it's displaying it as an H1. Um, and we see that when I clicked it, um, the HTML came up over here. And then the CSS for that is actually going to come up over on the right-hand side. Any CSS that uh, has to do with H1 will be loaded over here on the right-hand side. 
So um, when you first install WordPress, it already comes, when you install your um, WordPress theme, it's already going to have a lot of CSS done for you, which is the good part. You don't have to sit there and write thousands of lines of codes to decide the styling. That's pretty much one of the um, reasons why there are themes, is you can really quickly just say, OK, I generally like this styling. Let's load that up. Now, what I'm sure a lot of you have noticed is once you upload that theme, you're like, this is great, but th these are my brand colors. You know, this is pretty close to what I'm looking for, but you know, I just can't get that heading to be anything but black. Like, I really need it to be green because my, my logos are green and everything has that green. You know, green is my brand. Um, so you can end up taking your child theme and customizing it with CSS to have the exact styling you need if there's not user options already for that within your theme. Yes? One thing that confuses me is across, once you highlight something on the left side, across from it is the relational CSS, but you could scroll on the right side and lose. How do I know how far it relates? So that's a tricky part. You know, really, like, um, there's a, like there is going to be a lot of guess and check when you're first getting into CSS. Okay. If, you, if you don't know much about CSS, it's got, there is going to be some time where you, you try something out and you're like, oh, this is going to change this uh, heading to green, and it doesn't the first time. The good thing is, is you can try it a couple of times, and this isn't going to break your website, so you can kind of play around with it until you get it right. Now, so I'll get to... Well, it, all, of these, all of these CSS rules that I have over here do have something to do with H1. But oh, as you see, like, oh. this huge block has entry content H2. It has a lot of things that it's selecting to end up um, changing a rule. And I'll get into all of that here in just a second. I don't want to start explaining stuff without telling you guys the background to the explanations. Yes? The code, yeah. The, the code will tell you what, what you're changing for the most part. Um, and I'll show you a quick way to, to create a new rule specifically pertaining to that exact HTML element you selected here in just one moment. Um, so we have all of the edits over here. And now that I've selected a uh, CSS element or an HTML um, area, I can even go in here and I can right click and I can say new property, or sorry, add rule. And it will tell me what rule. It will automatically create for me a rule that's going to select that H1 area. Now, um, it will do, um, it will, for right here, it's saying entry content H1, because this uh, heading, this is the H1 heading. It's in entry content. It's an H1. Um, I could, if I just know I want to just affect all H1s, I could then write H1 in there. And that would be what's selecting there. So just an example, not so you can understand this, but so you can see what happens here, we can say H1, and I can say color, and I can type in blue. And you see all the H1s on the page are blue. Now let me back up a second. Um, Firebug is a way of previewing CSS changes and HTML changes and everything else. But for our purposes, it's a way of previewing CSS changes. So while I went in here and I said H1 color blue, if you went to this website right now, you wouldn't see that. This is just locally on my sheet machine. It's a way of previewing what adding this rule would do to my website. So it's a way of kind of figuring out what I want to do before I want to actually do it. Um, so I could even go to google.com. And I could say, hey, you know, I want to just see what the CSS is here. And you might think that I can't change Google because I don't have you know, any kind of access to Google. But you could say display. None. And all of a sudden, you can change Google's page. But if you went to Google right now, you wouldn't see that, because I haven't committed those changes to the website. I don't have access to, to Google. I can't commit those changes. But it's a way of me being able to play with CSS. And if I were to own Google, I could see what kind of CSS changes I need to make before I actually make them. I don't have to do any guessing. I don't have to go into code and just guess what the CSS rule would be and what kind of effect it would be. I can actually see that take place before I actually paste it into my CSS. But we'll get there in a second. I just wanted to show you a quick example of what can be done with CSS. So back to the uh, presentation here, or the slides. How to install Firebug on your computer. So if you don't have Firebug on your computer already, it's actually very easy, so I won't spend too much time showing you the exact thing. Generally, the rule you can do is just Google download Firebug. And uh, if you Google download Firebug, you'll see this link 
uh, well, first you need Firefox, so you can download Firefox through a link like this, or you can just Google download Firefox. Um, and the second step is to go to Google and type in download Firebug. You'll get to this link. You can click on it, and it's very um, user-friendly. You just say click on it. You click on it, it downloads. It says, do you want to install this to Firefox? You say, yes, I want to install this add-on. And sometimes it makes you re um, restart your Firefox before it shows up. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, so just install it. Um, you'll be on your way. And you can tell that you have Firebug next time you upload Firefox by seeing that bug in the top right-hand corner that I showed you earlier. Um, there are some add-ons to Firebug. So Firebug off the bat comes pretty lean. Um, you can add on so many different things to Firebug, and we'll get into this with questions at the end if you guys have any questions on how you can extend it. But two things I do recommend are Rainbow and Color Picker. Um, if you want to add those on, you do it the same way. You just Google download Rainbow for Firefox, download Color Picker for Firefox, um, and you add them on the same way. And they basically extend Firebug to be able to have very easy color selection ability. So instead of um, just having to type in blue, you can actually get the exact hex code you want by selecting color and dragging it and seeing. And I'll show you that here in um, just a minute as well. So um, what is CSS continued here? Um, so here's my little example of changing something on Google. Um, you know, I typed in background. Blue. If you see this little blue box right here, that doesn't come um, with Firefox, Firebug right off the bat. That is color picker. So that's a way that you can um, be able to extend the color abilities of Firefox uh, within there. Um, so here is um, a reference to, this here's some HTML. Um, so if we see up at the top, we have that little text. Um, we have text right here. And this is basically the HTML that would go into making this text. And if you see here, um, you can add div IDs. So basically, the way that CSS references HTML are there's these different sections, like H2s, which we see here, or div IDs. And most of these are already going to be done for you. So you don't have to go in there, and you don't have to do these custom. They're already going to be in the background. But I just want to show you how um, Firebug knows what section, how the sections are separated. So we see that div ID, section 11, um, would be this text area. So then I could go in and I could select that text area, and Firebug would see, oh, this is section 11. So anything he does to section 11 um, is going to affect this div. Um, same is true for this H2 area, um, which is the product I'm selling. So while this is the HTML and this is what you'd see in the background, you only see on the front end product I'm selling. So these things in the bracket are just a way, an HTML of saying, here's a different section in here. We have a, we always, almost always have a cl open bracket, um, either ID or C, uh, div ID or a CSS class, and then it will tell you what the ID is. Um, so example time. So um, we did a, a little bit of editing of what, um, how we changed colors, but we can do so many different things. Um, we can edit images. We can add padding. So let's just, as an example, let's say that we um, want to select this area right here. And it says, um, this is a text with a div ID. And if we see over here, I have um, gone and I've written my own uh, HTML element that says div ID equals unique div ID. And then it says, this is the text within a div ID. So while this is all the HTML, all we're seeing is the text within the brackets that says, this is text with a div ID. So I can click on this one area, which will highlight it. And then I can say new or add rule. And we'll see that it adds a new rule for me. And in this case, for div ID, I want to add a um, pound sign. And I can say unique. And I, can, I just typed in the U right here. And then Firebug was smart enough to say, hey, I know that there is a, uh, a div ID in there that's called unique div ID. I'm going to go ahead and fill that out. So I know that's already a div ID in there. And I can add the area. And then it adds the brackets on its own. And I'll, we'll, we'll get into all the different parts of it real quickly um, in, here in a second. But then I could say, um, let's say, text size, or font size, sorry. And let's do 40 pixels. And all of a sudden, 
our text is 40, 40 pixels. So then any place where the, it was marked as unique div ID, um, it would show up like that. Usually the difference between, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, OK, so back to slides here. So here's the parts of CSS, which is what I wanted to show you here. So for instance, um, we were looking at some of these rules. We have the selector up here, which, which is what's showing what is being edited within the CSS. So for right here, we have body, which is usually referring to body text. That would be if I wanted to just change the regular paragraphs in my theme, maybe um, someone was complaining that the text is too small on my website, which is a very common problem. People go in there and put like 13 pixel uh, font on their website, which might look good on some, on some devices and stuff. Some devices, it might be very hard to read. And really, you want to go with more like 15 pixels or something like that. So I could say body, and I could then say font size, and I could select 15 pixels. But in this case, um, I'm using the example of Google. So I've changed Google's website to say the body of Google's website. I want to have background, um, which is the property. So I, I'm doing what I want to change, uh, or uh, everything that I want to change, what I want to change about it, and how I want to change it. So that's selector, property, and value. So I'm saying I want to change the body, which is the general body of the website. And I want to change the background of that part. So I'm changing everything that's in the back. And I want to make it, this is a hex code that basically means black. I could type in black, and it would have the same exact, um, Firefox, Firebug would have the same exact um, reading of black as it does pound zero, 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 zero. Um, so then that makes the body background black. So those are your main parts of CSS. Um, there's so many different combinations that you can do in terms of selectors, properties, and values. Um, some of them are simple. Some of them can be very complicated. Um, so here is Firebug. Um, it's used to preview changes, which is what I got into a little bit earlier. So it's a way of finding those changes before you want to make them. It's not going to change it for everyone's site. But you do want to make sure that you have the right rule before you put it onto your website and the whole world sees it. So Firebug is a good way of previewing CSS um, without actually changing it for the whole world to see. Um, so once you find the rule, so let's say that we wanted to make Google's background black. And we knew that that rule worked. We saw it cha reflect, that change reflect on our website, and it looked good to us. What we'd want to do at that point is copy that CSS rule and put it into our own CSS. And we'd want to put it into the, our own CSS at the bottom, because that's uh, Cascading Style Sheets has a um, function in it that any rule that you put on the uh, bottom is going to overwrite all the rules above it that have the same exact property and, uh, uh, property and selector. So um, if it somewhere else in the website had said that the background of Google should be white, as it is, if I put the CSS rule underneath that says, no, it should be black, and it would overwrite that rule because it's below it. Um, and if that doesn't work, there's also a, a workaround where we can add important. I just wanted to put that on there because I end up using it a lot, though it's not technically something that you should use all the time. It is a way of saying, I just want this rule to definitely work, and I don't want it to be overwritten by anything else. So that's when we can add important. And I'll show you an example of that here in a second. Um, so where do I put my CSS to make it um, live? So every WordPress theme has a CSS file. Um, it will not, a, a theme will not work without a CSS file. So your theme definitely has a CSS file. And that is an option of where to put it. You can go into your themes. Um, appearance editor, and the first thing that comes up is going to be your CSS file, and we'll sh I'll show you an example of that here in a second. It's not recommended you put it in there for different reasons. You should either create a child theme that has all of your own customizations, so you can update your regular theme and not lose all of your customizations, or you should install a plugin that has a custom CSS area, or some themes actually come with their own specific custom CSS area right off the bat. Um, so. I'll show you from start to finish if I wanted to make a rule, if I wanted to preview a rule in Firebug, and then I wanted to uh, commit it onto the website into my CSS, sec CSS section. I'll show you that here. 
So um, back to our example of the firebug demo. Um, see these blue changes? I'm going to refresh, and we'll see that those changes go away. Those weren't changes that I committed. They were just changes within firebug. OK, there we go. So disappears, because that wasn't committed into the website. So let's do a slightly different CSS rule, just so we can um, see something different. So I have this big bug in here. And I'm thinking, OK, maybe that bug is a little bit too big. I can click on the inspector. I can highlight the bug. And I can say, right click, add rule. And it's going to automatically create what it thinks I might want to be adding in here. It's for, in this case, it's going to say align center, size full, and WP image 5. These are three different ways of selecting this image. Um, for beginners, you might just want to stick with what it says in here and see what kind of change it has. But be careful, because sometimes um, I might be changing the bug on this screen and not realize that the same CSS rule is on every page of my website. And I could be making one change that affects my entire website. So that is something to be careful about. So when you're doing CSS, you just got to really make sure when you commit the change to double check all the page, you know, certain pages of your website to make sure, is, did this change have this, the effect that I wanted it to? For my case, um, I, all I want is WP image 5. I know that that's going to be referencing this image specifically and nothing else on my website. So I'm just going to delete the rest. But again, um, it wouldn't be the end of the world if you just stuck with that and, and just ch used that selector. But I'm just going to use WP image 5. And I'm going to put in here width 200 pixels. Sure enough, it changed it. Now, I could go in there and resize that image. But let's say that I had you know, 3,000 of these images within my website. Um, and I wanted to make, all, make sure all of them were 200 pixels. I could very easily do that in CSS with one rule, whereas if I was going to change the image, I would have to go back in and change each of those image sizes in HTML uh, to commit those changes. Now, that's a bad example because really you should change the image size. You really shouldn't go in there in CSS and, and force all the sizes because then your computer has to upload a big image and then shrink it, and it's going to be a lot more taxing on everyone's system. Um, but it is possible. Um, and just as an example, um, we'll, we'll use that. Um, so now I see that this is a frustrating thing of firebugs. Sometimes when you make the changes, it disappears. But I know it's still in there somewhere. I just have to scroll down. And here it is, WP image 5. And I can just highlight this area, uh, either hit Edit Copy, or I'm just going to do Command C, and it and unhighlighted here. So I'm going to do Command, uh, Command C to copy it. I'm going to go back to my back end of my website, the admin area of my website. And I'm going to go to Appearance Editor. So no matter what theme you have, you're going to have this area on your website, Appearance Editor. Um, and the first thing that's going to, you're going to see when you get there is always the style CSS. Every theme has it again. And you'll see within this theme, They've already done a ton of work with CSS. It's just you can scroll for days, and it just keeps on going. They've already done all that work to, for you to make it look pretty good. But obviously, it didn't have that one CSS change that I wanted. So I'm going to go to the very bottom, because again, cascading style sheets, I want to put my changes on the bottom so they take precedence over the rules above them. Are you working on a child theme? I am not. I'm not. So this is how you can do it. The, the, cowboy coding way. Okay. It's not recommended. I'm going to show you that this is possible, and then I'm going to show you the correct way to do it as well. Um, so you can add it in here and update file. And then I can refresh. And before where my change went away, you see that my change stuck in there because I added it to the CSS file. Now, I'm not going to want to save that change, even though this is a test site and it doesn't really matter. That's not the, the right place to put it. Um, the better way to do it is put it in a custom CSS file, whether it's in your child theme. Or one easy way to do it is to download a plugin that will add a custom CSS um, file to your website. So um, let's see here. Where was I? Um, so the theme, the plugin is called Simple. Uh, custom CSS. So I'm going to go to Plugins and Add New. Um, and we'll see here if I just type in simple 
custom CSS should be one of the first things that pops up is simple custom CSS. Um, and this is a, a slight tangent, but when you're looking for plugins, always look at the plugins and how many people are using them. Uh, generally stay away from plugins that have bad um, ratings, especially when you're typing in something like simple CSS. There's going to be a million plugins that do a very similar thing. But you see here, you probably don't want to download the one that's rated zero stars. Um, you'd probably much prefer to go with the one that 106 people have rated five stars and 200,000 people are using it. So we're going to download a simple custom CSS. It'll ask you, are you sure you really want to install it? Yes, um, this is a WP Engine thing. That won't come up on your computer. Um, and so now that it's installed, it's asking us if we want to activate the plugin. And we're, we'll go ahead and activate the plugin. And we'll see once the internet works, we'll see that it has added the plugin to our website and it is activated because it says deactivate. Now we can get here um, to our custom CSS by just saying add CSS. And we'll see we have our own very clean custom CSS area without all that additional information in there to confuse us. Um, this will, um, in all cases, this will be um, something that is in CSS's eyes beneath your parent theme CSS. So these changes should take precedence over the other ones um, in most cases. Uh, question in the back? Um, a child theme, you have the ability to extend your theme in much more ways than just CSS. So um, there's not really necessarily a disadvantage to doing it this way. There's just really an advantage to doing a child theme if you're going to um, be customizing functionality as well as CSS. If you're going to be adding PHP to your, web, to your website that you want to be customized, that's something you have to do in a child theme for the most part. Um, so really, um, if you're just looking to add CSS, um, custom CSS, there's no reason why you need to do a, a child theme just for that. Um, it's probably it's like the, the way that if you know, you're a very um, diligent coder and you're going to do everything completely perfectly, you might do a um, child theme just because it's like the best way to do it. This is the easy, for a beginner, this is probably the easiest way to do it. You're going to have so much less trouble um, adding a plugin like this, then you are creating a whole uh, child theme to your, adding a child theme to your uh, website. Right, exactly. With this, since it's in a plugin, you can update your, update your theme all day, and this is going to stay completely separate as a plugin. So you're not going to, you're going to have two separate places. Um, your, your theme's going to be in one place. This plugin is going to be in a different place, and they shouldn't ever, you know, if you update your theme, it should never overwrite this. Uh, question? Yes. Just that one area. Um, well, that's a matter of finding the exact code that um, pertains to that one section. And it's not necessary, I mean, it's not necessarily true that every single item on your website is going to have its unique um, CSS ID, div ID. Um, some of them are going to um, not have a way to just affect one area. Now, you can go in there if you know HTML and it's a HTML editable uh, section of your website, you can go in there and you can add div ID equals unique div ID for this section and then close it off. And you can do that, though um, right off the bat, not every section has its uh, customizable uh, unique div ID for that one little area. Um, so it's a little bit, at the beginning, if you're a beginner, the answer is it's a little bit of a guess and check. Um, there's not going to be... There's not one way I can tell you for you know, exactly how to find that one rule or that one div ID that you need to change. Um, so when you go back and do it, if I find one, did it change a bunch of stuff go back yes. and do it? Yes. Yes, exactly. That's, and that's another reason why having um, CS, uh, a, sim, a simple custom CSS editor is good, is your CSS is going to be separate from your themes. So then you can easily go back in here and see, oh, this CSS rule I added and it had adverse effects to my website. I'm just going to delete that and try again. Um, and that's, it's unfortunately, it, it's going to be at the beginning a little bit of a guess and check. But that is also a plus because, I mean, that's how I learned how to do CSS. You know, I didn't take any classes. I didn't, I had no idea what I was doing several years ago with CSS. 
and it's just, you know, I got Firebug and I just started trying things out and I've made plenty of mistakes, but it's never blown up my website. It's never given me the white screen of death. Um, so it's a very um, easy way to jump into some coding without having uh, huge worries about terrible effects to your website. And usually if it's a, like a weird effect to the website, it's going to be something like the text is a little bit, you know, it's not going to be a, a functionality problem. It's just going to be a slightly weird styling issue. Um, but I do recommend that when you make changes, you really go through your website and make sure those changes um, are positive and that they're what you expected, uh, the results that you expected. Uh, yes, in the back. Uh, sorry, I can't quite, I didn't quite hear you. Yes. Yes. Um, so yeah, this file, yeah, your um, different sites can have a whole bunch of different CSS files. Generally, correct coding would be that you have one CSS file, but a lot of times there's different reasons why there's like different layers of CSS file. This custom, S, custom CSS file will um, take control and, and overwrite any f other files above it. They're still going to be up there and they're still going to be working, but if you have the same property and selector in custom, your custom CSS as in your parent uh, themes CSS, the one in your custom CSS is going to overwrite the other one, the uh, same rule in your other CSS files. Does that help answer your question? OK, great. Yes, right here. Right. Yes, that's a very good point, especially if you're dealing with adding CSS to your actual theme, which again is not recommended, though it's possible. You always want to make sure you grab a copy, copy and paste it into a text document and save it, and just make sure, as he said, worst comes to worst, you can always copy and paste back over all your changes you made and it will revert your site back to how it was before you ever started getting into it. Um, yes? Does it make sense to use this with a child theme? Yes. With a child oh, um, if your child theme has a, a CSS area that you, can, uh, that you feel comfortable editing, there's not too much extra CSS in there. Um, even in a child theme, the child theme usually adds some extended uh, styling from the parent theme. Um, in, in a lot of cases, like if you're using the Genesis framework, um, so Genesis is your parent theme, and then you install a child theme like Outreach Pro or one of their child themes underneath it, um, you're still going to be in that child theme having so much CSS that's already written in that CSS file in your child theme. So in that case, you may want to still install simple uh, custom CSS so that you have an additional area that's just the changes you made. You're not going to get confused and accidentally delete some CSS that was in your child theme that you really wanted. Um, you know, it's a lot harder to make mistakes if you use a standalone pl a plugin that's going to have its standalone CSS, custom CSS file. So you wouldn't have a child theme of a child theme. I mean, <laughs> just referring to Genesis on grandchild. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> I was going to say that. Yes, yeah, exactly. You, you, it's much easier, you, it's much better to just, you know, stick with this, with this kind of plugin. Um, let me get through a couple more slides, and then I'm gonna, I'll have some questions at the end. Um, what time? What, so I guess we're working with just a couple more minutes. Let me get through a couple more slides. We'll take some questions, and then at the, um, after the talk, I'm going to be in the happiness bar, so I can sit down with each one of you that needs help and, and answer your specific questions as well. Um, let me just make sure I get through all my slides, if you don't mind. Um, so it's also a good idea to do uh, comments in your CSS. So if I was going to add one of those CSS rules in here, uh, my WP image 5. As we see here, um, up above it, this is actually a comment. So this has nothing, this is going to have no effect on the actual CSS. This is just a way of me taking note and saying, oh, um, you know, I want to um, uh, comment goes here to describe what I was thinking when I added this rule. So you don't forget um, that you put something in there for a reason. It kind of gives you an idea. You could even put a date in here so you know exactly when you made that change. Or if multiple people are working in the file, you can say rules added by Michael. And then it can be a very easy way. If someone else is going into the file, they know, 
oh, I need to talk to Michael about these CSS rules. He made a couple mistakes. Or maybe I just want to pick his brain about a couple of them. I don't know. Um, it's a great idea to make as many comments as, as you want in there. And the way you do that is you put forward slash asterisk, comment, whatever you want in there, and then asterisk forward slash. And that's going to be a way of saying anything in between those two, uh, in, in between those two uh, forward slashes is going to be my comment. And uh, especially when you get into having hundreds of CSS rules, it's a good idea to break them out and comment them and section them so um, you can quickly get to one rule if you need to edit it. Um, uh, what else can I do with CSS? So we did some pretty simple things. You, um, one thing that I wanted to make sure I touched on was that you, um, if anybody's heard of responsive design, almost all of that is done with CSS. Um, it can be done with JavaScript and other stuff, but um, for the most part, it's done with uh, CSS, and you can write rules like, um, like in here, we can say at media, max width, 600 pixels. So what that's going to say is this CSS only goes into play, the, your browser's only going to render it if we're working with a browser that's 600 pixels or less. So if you're working in a, on a phone, let's say that um, in this example, I have sidebar display none. So on a phone, it makes sense a lot of times um, where you don't want to see a sidebar of a blog. You just want to see the blog here, and the sidebar is just not going to fit on the page there because we, we only have a certain amount of real estate for the width there. So I might say, yeah, the sidebar is great, but as soon as the screen gets to be 600 pixels, I want to get rid of the sidebar. So this is a way of um, telling CSS, hey, this rule is great, but I only want it to work if the browser is under 600 pixels. So then if you went into a um, web browser, and let's just, um, let's for instance go back here. And let's say that we wanted to make this smaller. So the CSS is going to make sure that nothing's hanging over the page. It's going to make things a certain width um, to, to respond appropriately. So um, responsive CSS is very helpful. Um, and it's a great way, you know, like even when themes are technically responsive, you'll still add some content and it won't quite work like you want it to. So um, that's a reason why you might want to take a look at um, responsive CSS. Um, and you know, I'm giving you the basic overview. I know that a lot of this is going to end up being something that you have to Google, um, and, and that's you know that's okay, and that's how I learned. You know, if if you want to know how do I write a CSS rule for um, you know for iPhones or for under 600 pixels or for max width, blah blah blah, type into Google uh, responsive CSS, um, how to write responsive CSS. Google that there'll be so much information that you can't even decide which article to read because there's going to be so many good articles out there. Um, you can also do cool things like animations. And I just wanted to show you guys a couple of quick examples to, s to show you how cool CSS can be because it can be pretty boring just changing <coughs> colors and stuff. But you can also do um, crazy amounts of things. And let's see if it will load because it's, uh, it's a big page here. But you can do cool, you know, crazy things like this. Like this is mostly all done in CSS. There is, I believe, this one has some JavaScript in there too. But there are some examples that have no CSS. Like um, I believe this one doesn't. Yeah. So there's nothing in JavaScript. So this is all done in CSS. This little uh, submarine going around and the bubbles and the animation. That's all CSS. Now that's really advanced CSS, and it's probably something that um, you won't have to ever really do on your website. But you know, it just shows you that while CSS um, can do simple things, you can also get really advanced with it. Um, that's about the end of my slides. Let's see if I have anything else. Um, yeah, just my uh, slide about Google can help. Um, pretty much anything that you have a question about with CSS is Googleable, um, and you know, so many people have Googled it in the past. So many people have Googled it in the past that there's going to be articles for it. There's going to be more explanations than you need. Um, W3Schools is a great resource. Um, this link in, in particular for CSS is just amazing because it starts off with one page, and you can just go keep on diving deeper and deeper into CSS with this. It, it's going to get, you know, it's going to get complicated at some point, but for the most part. Um, it starts pretty simple, and it has a good work down of starting simple and getting more complex as you go. And here's that page um, on, uh, that I went to here. 
and it just has really simple CSS examples, um, and it says it has little quizzes, and you can try it yourself. So this is basically a little online school for CSS. Um, while I, I never went through the whole thing, it was, it's definitely been a resource that I've used um, even to this day to find, you know, what was that one CSS rule that I, you know, really like for um, doing the um, transition, you know, fade in element, um, you know, to have an element fade into a page instead of just be there. Um, so that's a great resource um, should you need some extra information. And um, that's it. So uh, questions, we'll get back to that. Yes, right here. Um, oh, yes. So I never showed you all that part. So um, rainbow is this little thing right here. And what this does is it lets me hover over anything on the website. So I can say, oh, you know, I know this, <laughs> I know this website has this color that I like. What is that hex color? So I can click on rainbow, and I can hover over anything, and it will show me that exact color there. Um, and I use this all the time. If, if, a, if a client gives me their website and they already have a certain color scheme going on, but they have no idea what the hex color is, I don't have to do any guessing. I can quickly go in there and rainbow, hover over the element, and it tells me pound 4 c a f 50 I can click it once, it copies it to my clipboard, and then I can just paste it wherever I want. Um, so that's a, you know, an easy way of matching things on your website. You can very quickly grab that. And just as a quick example, on the opposite side of that, um, color picker is the thing within um, Firebug that allows you to use that same thing in here. So if I say color uh, blue, it gives me this. But then I can also open this up and I can say, oh, no, maybe I want it to be green over here. And I can start moving it around and we'll see tutorial is changing colors as I'm moving this bar around. So it's a quick way of me being able to play with the colors without knowing hex codes and without having to get those ugly, like if you just type in blue, it's going to give you straight out of the box ugly blue. Um, and most of the time, you're not going to want to use those colors because those are like kind of the late 90s web font styles because you would, back in the day, just choose, oh, I want this to be blue. And there'd be that one primary blue that's a little bit ugly. And you might want to you know, soften it up a little bit to a nice, much more pleasant blue. Um, so that is Fire Picker. And again, there's so many more add-ons to Firefox, I mean to Firebug. Um, there is I, the one other one that I like is changes. I can see, um, you know, after I make those changes, as I showed you that one time, it kind of shuffled around and all of a sudden I couldn't find that change that I made. Um, if I install changes, then I can see exactly what changes I've made to the web page um, in Firebug. So I can make a whole bunch of changes to the web page, get it how I like it, and then in changes, it will have this big list of changes that I've made to the website to get it to where I want. And then I can copy and paste one fell swoop all of the changes I made, put it into my CSS, um, save it, and then again, whenever you make CSS changes, whenever you paste those CSS changes and update, always go back to the front end and double check and triple check those changes had the correct um, effect to the website. And um, one thing I will say is sometimes you'll make a CSS change, it will work in Firebug, you'll put it in your custom CSS, and for some reason it just doesn't do the same thing it did. Don't be worried, that happens all the time. Um, it's frustrating, I know. Sometimes you just got to find a different angle at it, and you're just not using quite the right rule, and Firebug you know, displays it one way, but it doesn't work. Um, you, it is going to be a little bit of guess and check at the beginning. You, you wanted to mention the important rule. Yes, OK, the important rule. So let's say that I put this in here, and I realized this, wasn't, this was being overwritten by something else, and I just can't get it to show up. Or let's, uh, if I can sh show an example in the front end, it will be a little easier. Um, So if I added um, color blue, and uh, I see that it doesn't make the effect that I want it to. If I put important over there, it's going to make sure it overwrites everything else. So what, what had happened there when I put color blue is some other rule was overwriting um, the rule that I was putting in here. And it just was not coming up. So what I can say is while something else might be taking precedence over this, this is important. I want this to take precedence. So this will say, OK, important. Let's, you know, any other rule that has to do with this, let's overwrite that, and let's put it up there. Sometimes when important doesn't work, and why you might want to uh, you know, not use important all the time, is if you put important on every rule, and you put an important on another rule, it's going to be like, well, which one's more important? And unfortunately, there's not a more important rule. Um, so you, you want to be careful and only use important only if it's actually super important. Yes? 
particular about color. Uh -huh. It has to be quite compatible. Sure. Are any of these tools able to show you? Well, um, we can Google it. Uh, color safe firebug. Let's just see what comes up when we do that. Um, Probably your best bet is to find, um, I think that there's websites that will tell you that you can put in a hex code and it will give you the closest color safe um, or a web a print safe or what, I forget the exact terminology. It will give you that right uh, hex code that's similar to the one that you wanted but is actually the safe version. Um, that's going to be, I don't have the exact website off the top of my head, but I'm sure if you Google it you can find um, let's see, color safe hex code, something like that. Um, so you could see something like this, and then you could search for the one that you were putting in there and find something similar. Um, but I'm sh I, I know that there's more advanced tools than just this big list of, of colors. Colors um, differ on every monitor. I mean, you never, yeah. unless you have a calibrated monitor. Sure. And that can be a problem. I mean, uh, you know, as a designer, I know that's an issue, and I'll be like, no, this, this logo is looking great. And then they're like, well, on my PC from 20 years ago, that uh, dark blue is looking brown, and I'm like, you know, I'm I'm sorry, that's the, that's the monitor, you know, like I can make it um, as close to as as I can, but each monitor is going to be different, and that's just an unfortunate um, thing Your about designing. Well, like you know, like really, uh, monitors are, are getting better and better, so eventually it won't be as much of a problem. But unfortunately, for now, it definitely is, especially when you're dealing with print and you're dealing with web sites and that those colors are going to look different too so it can be it can be tricky to find the right colors yes yeah yeah there's so many differences that's true mm -hmm. and your phone right and And, and different browsers will also uh, use CSS differently. So there's actually, confusingly, there's sometimes different rules uh, depending on the browser. And that's usually more of an advanced thing for like colors and font sizes. That's going to generally be browser uh, non-specific. But for things, there's like Firefox specific codes that only will work on Firefox, like transitions and stuff that won't work on Safari. And especially Internet Explorer seems to be one that no, like Internet Explorer only is like, oh, I'll use half of these CSS rules. I don't really know what you're talking about for the rest of them. So um, definitely check on all browsers if you can. Yes? I was just for color calibration across systems, uh, if you type in P-A-N-T-O-N-E, that is the worldwide established authority on color. Sure. Pantone says a color is it is. Right. You can get calibration for your cameras, for your monitors. Sure. Yes, Pantone. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever have you ever found a good tutorial on Firebug? Um, I actually did one three years ago or something like that. Um, I actually. Yeah, I know. Uh, Vimeo. Lots of things like, you know, where there's cross outs, and I kind of have to refresh my memory about the hierarchy of stuff that's crossed out. And sure. Um, little, so, little as I was saying, in, in 2012, I did this one, and it's very quick. It's only five minutes. You know, I spent, what, 30 minutes, 40 minutes um, now talking about Firebug. But it, this might be a good reference for you. Honestly, there's probably better ones out there. Um, it's not the most um, extensive one, but I did do one on Vimeo. And if you Google um, new tricks, how to use Firebug, um, it will come up. It's a Vimeo video. And I just kind of go through basically what I did today, um, showing you how to install Firebug, and then showing you uh, how to set it up. And you know, basic, basically, it will be a refresher of what we did today. Um, but you know, again, Google's your friend. You can probably Google one and find one that's much better than the one that I did quickly three years ago. Yes. For fonts, um, I have uh, a plugin called What Font, um, and that is that is great. Um, so I use actually no, the one I use is Font Finder. I, I have used What the Font, um, Font Finder, and so I can go over and I can say, oh, what is this font? 
and it will tell me everything it, it can about the font. It can say it will say font family is Arial, uh, sans serif, um, font finder, is font finder, um, and that's just a quick way. Like you know, it's a good way if I'm like going through websites and I'm trying to find my own font. I can find a font I like. I can click on font finder. I can select um, any font, and it will come up. It's a Firefox add-on. So if you just Google font finder, Firefox add-on, um, there should be pretty clear instructions on how to get that going. Um, I have time for maybe one more question. Anyone else? <laughs> OK, well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs>